Hello and welcome to this uh, webinar on sleep problems with uh, particular reference to veteran and military populations. A warm welcome to our participants all around Australia. Um, at the moment we're up to about 470 something which is a, a very impressive number and I guess um, really speaks to what an important issue this is for us as clinicians. Uh, a warm welcome to those of you who are watching it as a podcast and of course a special welcome to our panelists. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands around Australia upon which our panelists and our participants are located. I'd like to pay our respects to their elders, past and present, for the memories, the traditions, the culture, and the hopes of Indigenous Australia. My name is Mark, Mark Creamer, and I'm a clinical psychologist. And I've had a long interest in traumatic stress, and, and particularly in um, traumatic stress in veterans and military populations. And um, as a clinician, I find I'm consistently confronted with issues around sleep problems. So uh, it's a really great pleasure for me tonight to be facilitating this, uh, this webinar and to be able to learn a bit from our distinguished panelists. So without further ado, let me introduce them. Um, you already have the uh, bios for our panelists, so I won't go through it in detail. But um, first of all, can I uh, introduce Dr. David Cunnington? David is a specialist sleep physician, so he's clearly our content expert for, for tonight's discussion. Welcome, David. Yeah, thanks, Mark. And I guess I, I should kick off with the obvious question. How's your sleep, David? Uh, good enough. And I'll explain <laughs> a bit later during the podcast or the webinar what good enough means, which means, yeah, I don't sleep perfectly, and uh, like everyone, I have bad nights and good nights, but sleep works well enough that I can just get on with life, and it's not holding me back too much. Good. Well, good enough. I reckon that's probably a good thing. What, um, what's first got you interested in sleep? Uh, well, training as a respiratory physician, I did training in sleep apnea, uh, but then had the fortunate uh, position of doing a fellowship at Harvard in around 2000, 2001, and at the time, they were doing a lot of neuroscience research in sleep-wake regulatory mechanisms, which I'll actually talk a bit about shortly, and I had the opportunity to work with some great psychiatrists like Alan Hobson um, in Massachusetts, uh, and that really spurred my interest in everything else to do with sleep, not necessarily just sleep apnea. So I've been hooked ever since. Right. Certainly, um, certainly a very important area. Thanks, David. Um, uh, I'd like to introduce now uh, Dr. Andrea Phelps. Andrea is a clinical psychologist with extensive experience working in the area of PTSD and veterans and sleep uh, and PTSD in particular. So welcome, Andrea. Thank you very much, Mark. Good to be here. Uh, Andrea and I go back uh, further than I like to remember. Actually, uh, we first worked together in public sector psychiatry uh, nearly three decades ago. I think. Oh, Mark, please. <laughs> well, yeah, we, 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 should, we shouldn't go too much into that. Um, but, um, well, let me ask you the same question, Andrea. Are, are you a good sleeper? I, I am, actually. I um, have the occasional bad night when I'm too stressed, but uh, it usually settles down very quickly. So uh, the next night I... I catch up and uh, yeah, generally very good sleeper. Good, good, good. Thankfully. Good. <laughs> Thankfully indeed. Okay. Um, I was thinking, Andrea, that you've been working with, um, you've been working with veterans for a long time and all sorts of different populations of veterans. I'm just wondering whether you notice any difference in terms of sleep problems between um, perhaps our older veterans, our Vietnam era, Korean, even World War II veterans and the younger guys who are just coming back from the Middle East. Do you, do you see different kind of patterns there? Look, it, it's actually interesting. It's remarkably similar. I think what you see uh, with with veterans over those different eras. I guess the difference is how entrenched some of the sleep habits are, whether that be sort of um, nightmares or, or whether it be other aspects of sleep disruption. So, the longer someone's had the sleep problems, the more um, wedded they are to, to their sleep habits, and sometimes can be. Um, challenged by the idea of, of changing some of those habits. The younger, more contemporary veterans are, are probably a bit more open to the idea of, of trying out some of the, the techniques, perhaps. But look, in terms of the sleep problems themselves, I'd say you know, very similar. Mm. Interesting. Interesting. OK, thank you, Andrea. And our uh, third and final panelist is uh, Dr. Curtis Gray. Curtis is a psychiatrist from Brisbane. And uh, he has a particular interest in insomnia and also in traumatic stress. So uh, 
A warm welcome, Kurt. Thanks, Mark. Hello, everyone. And uh, let me ask you the same question then, Kurt. How's your sleep? Uh, like David and Andrea, it's um, usually good, and I would say good enough too, because it, uh, it you, again, to call Colin David's term, it facilitates me um, getting on and living a pretty busy life. Yeah, yeah. Good, good, good. And I should self-disclose and say that my, uh, my sleep is particularly good. I think it's one of my great strengths, my sleep, which I'm eternally grateful for, even though it drives my wife mad sometimes when she's suffering a bit of insomnia. But there we are. Um, just to come back to you, Kirk, can, uh, I'm, I'm interested in the fact that, of course, um, we can see sleep disorders on their own. We can see primary insomnia, but very often we sleep, see sleep problems in the context of other disorders. Do you think if we can address the sleep in these other disorders like depression or PTSD or other anxiety disorders, are we going to get a flow-on effect in terms of other symptoms, do you think? I think we do um, to some extent, although um, unfortunately not always because sometimes the sleep disturbance um, is secondary to the psychiatric syndrome. Of course, I see a, a biased population to some degree because as a psychiatrist I receive referrals that have you know a psychiatric flavor to the referrer um, and so uh, for example I might see somebody who is uh, suffering a fairly severe agitated depression and their sleep is pretty bad and if it's severe enough no no amount of um, CBT uh, which is usually the First line treatment for insomnia, for example, is going to make much difference. They need sort of more robust somatic therapies. On the other hand, um, uh, I would I would see a large percentage of patients where at least some gain can be made, uh, even in conditions like major depression of moderate severity, um, if you um, uh, appropriately treat the sleep disturbance. Yeah. I think, yeah, it's a very important point, isn't it? And I'm sure we'll come back to that idea of how we, um, how we make a decision of where we should be going first and what order we should be treating things in. But anyway, thanks very much for that, Kurt. Thanks to the whole panel. Lovely to, to have you on board. Um, let me just uh, say a couple more things, by the way, of introduction. Oh, see, I should have put that slide up earlier. Sorry about that. Um, but uh, I just wanted to talk a little bit about this webinar series. So. As you're probably aware, this is um, one of a series of, of webinars that the Department of Veterans Affairs has engaged MHPN, or the Mental Health Professionals Network, to conduct in the area of um, mil military and veteran mental health. And this is the third one on sleep. Um, the next one is going to be in April, and we're going to be looking at substance use disorders. And then we've got a couple more coming up over the, the following months, uh, one on anger and one on the impact of uh, veteran mental health problems on families. So keep an eye out for that. I hope you've had a chance to have a look at the case study, the, the case vignette of Sally that we sent around. Um, I think Sally is, is not an unusual kind of story. And, and um, I guess that she represents a bit of an amalgam of the various cases that, that we've seen over the years. So um, we're going to be using Sally's case as um, a kind of context, a sort of springboard to, a, to, to look at some of the issues raised by her case and, and some of the broader issues in, uh, in looking at sleep problems. Um, and although she is a veteran, uh, I think most of what we say tonight uh, will be equally applicable to other populations, uh, including other PTSD or, or traumatized populations. But what she will do is, or what that case vignette will do is provide us with a, a kind of context and a springboard to, um, to work off. Uh, the learning objectives are fairly straightforward. As you can imagine, that, that uh, after the webinar and after discussing Sally's case and the issues raised, uh, we're, we're hoping that you'll have a better understanding of the, uh, the nature, the prevalence, the um, epidemiology of, of sleep disorders, uh, a better understanding about treatments, both psychological and, uh, and medical treatments. And of course, through that, we, we hope that you'll have an increased confidence in, in supporting and treating veterans with sleep disorders. OK. So at that point, can I um, move? Uh, oh, I should just tell you about the format, actually. Sorry about that. In terms of the format, what we're going to do now is move on to each of our panelists who are going to talk for five minutes. And uh, they've been strictly told they're only allowed to talk for five minutes. If they talk for much longer, I'm going to start coughing embarrassingly. But anyway, five minutes they can talk for. Um, 
Uh, so that's the three of them, and then we'll spend the bulk of the time in a uh, broader discussion, and I'll talk about that when the time comes. So without further ado, can I hand over to our first panelist, uh, David Cunnington, to talk about uh, the issues raised by Sally's case for you. Over, over to you, David. Yeah, thanks very much, Mark. I really think this is a complex case. And like you say, in clinical practice, most people are complex, and there's more than one thing going on in most people that we see. And when I'm trying to manage or assess people with sleep problems, and there's lots of layers to it, usually my approach is to try and think about what sleep disorders may be present uh, and how I'm going to map some of someone's symptoms and sleep disorders to physiological systems that regulate sleep. Because that then gives me a framework of how to approach the problem. And that's what I'm going to talk you through. So in terms of assessing sleep problems, in Sally's case, there's components of all five of these areas. So there are components of insomnia. Think of that as not getting enough sleep despite having adequate opportunity. Different from lifestyle things where people choose not to have enough sleep and trade off sleep for work or other activities. She seems to have problems with sleep quality, lots of movement. I do wonder about sleep apnea. Not because she's got specific symptoms of sleep apnea, but because she's sleepy. She had that car accident. And sleepiness is not generally a feature of insomnia. Tiredness is, but not overt sleepiness and sort of fall asleep accidents. There's stuff going on during sleep, so parasomnias. In her case, there's a couple of nightmares with uh, recurrent themes uh, and some movements that may represent a non-REM parasomnia. There's some features of sleeping at the wrong time, so circadian phase delay, which is often a behavioural thing that people get into of behaviours that are reversive or not conducive to sleep in the evening that delay the onset of sleep and you get into a later and later sleep time. And she's also got these features of being too sleepy and an associated hypersomnia. It may or may not be tied up in mood, uh, but there are some features of that. When I'm trying to then think about sleep and sleep problems, I do try to bring it back to some of the neurobiology of sleep. So sleep's regulated uh, by a number of neurotransmitters. I think of orexin, which is at the top of that slide, as a controller neurotransmitter. So it's involved in promoting wakefulness via activating monoaminergic neurons. And they, pr they use serotonin, dopamine, adrenaline, noradrenaline, histamine as the main wake-promoting neurotransmitters. Orexin also acts as a stabiliser of the relationship between wake and sleep. So in the presence of orexin, we're either stably awake or in the absence of orexin, usually stably asleep. Um, but if we don't have good orexin levels, particularly during the day, we'll feel sleepy and have a lot of instability of sleep and wake. Uh, acetylcholine is also important in the regulation of sleep and wake. That's at the bottom of the diagram. It modulates the relationship between non-REM and REM sleep. So a lot of the medications that are used in uh, mental health have anticholinergic side effects. So suppress REM, which is actually one of the treatments for depression. And the sleep-promoting neurotransmitter is mainly GABA. And a lot of the medications we use are also GABAergic medications. So if I then take that neurobiology and try and bring it back to a system approach, when I'm working with clients, this is what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of what factors are there that are circadian factors, what factors are their wakefulness system, and what about the sleep system? Because for each of those systems, I'll try and identify in the history, the narrative, part of my clinical evaluation, what people are doing in terms of thinking behaviour, changes under underlying physiology that are going to impact on that system. So for example, the thinking about a circadian system. So in Sally's case, she previously had worked shift work as a nurse. That really gives people a belief that sleep's fragile, hard to come by, elusive, important. Um, can, often people who've worked as nurses tell me 10 years down the track, it looked like broke my circadian rhythm. Didn't break it, but it does make them think about sleep in a very different way. The current behaviour is some behaviours that are stimulating in the evening that's preventing the onset of sleep, so exacerbating the circadian system. So working through things in that sort of way gives me a framework. And I try to then think of what are some circadian factors around thinking and beliefs, behaviours, changes to physiology that I can manipulate. And I do exactly the same for the wake system and exactly the same for the sleep homeostatic system. An example of the sleep homeostatic system is she's spending too long in bed reacts by sleeping in if she's had a bad night's sleep, so doesn't have enough sleep debt on the next night to help getting off with sleep. So if I can get those three factors for each of those three systems, then I've often got nine things I can do for someone, even if they're a really hard case and everyone feels like they're at their wit's end. 
So just some final clinical tips. Listen. The narrative really tells the story around sleep. If there's emotion in the narrative, it tells you that there's some beliefs about sleep that need to be addressed to make some headway around sleep. Second point, it's not always about the night, and I'm sure we'll come back to this in this case. There's lots of stuff in this case that I think is not sleep at all. Um, but my third point, there's attributional bias, and a lot of the stuff's been attributed to sleep. And often I see health professionals be complicit with this and amplify this and feed back to patients, yeah, look, if only you got your sleep better, you could move forward. Or statements like, you can't move forward until your sleep's better. Now, they're actually unhelpful beliefs about sleep that increase um, sleep-related anxiety and get in the way. It's opposite to what we're trying to do with cognitive therapy and CBT. We'll also talk a bit further. I like Kurt's uh, point in the introduction about sleep maybe needing its own treatment, but I think the comorbid conditions need their own treatment too. And I'm not a fan of sleep hygiene. I'm happy to be challenged on that later. Thanks, Mark. Thank you very much, David. And uh, thank you. For, I'm really pleased that you finished on a nice controversial note there because... Uh, we certainly will be coming back to that one later without any question. But thank you very much for that. Um, uh, I'm just, yeah, let me just ask you quickly. Um, I guess you know a lot of people will tell us that they have a few drinks to uh, to help them sleep. Um, just can you just say a couple of words about alcohol and, and whether or not what, what impact that has on our sleep uh, sleep quality? Yeah, so it's a double-edged sword. So the seduction of alcohol is that it can help with getting off to sleep for some people, help with settling waking anxiety. It can have that behavioural transition of just the sitting down with a drink marks a boundary between I'm a mentally active, alert person to now I'm a casual, getting ready for sleep person. So that's the seduction of it. But the negative effects are it increases that monoaminergic drive, particularly in the second half of the night as alcohol is metabolised. So yes, somebody may feel like they get off to sleep better, but it has a negative impact on sleep quality, particularly in the second half of the night, and makes people feel more tired the next day. But because of attributional bias, they'll often attribute the feeling tired to the minutes of sleep or loss of minutes of sleep rather than the alcohol. So the answer is, well, I must have slept enough, I'll take more alcohol, feel more tired, and it feeds into that vicious cycle. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, David. And I think a particular issue for many of our veteran uh, clients and patients who do I think often tend to use alcohol as a way of coping. Anyway, thank you very much, David. Let's move on now and hear from um, our clinical psychology perspective, hear from Andrea. Uh, Andrea, as I said, is, is an expert in, in PTSD and, um, uh, and sleep and, and especially nightmares, actually. So uh, over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Mark. Uh, so, yeah, so when I look through the uh, vignette, I guess the core issues that, that jump out at me are the nature of the sleep issues that, that Sally's presenting with. So she describes having difficulty getting off to sleep and, and being restless during the night. She talks about recurring nightmares, two different nightmares, one replay and one not uh, a direct replay of a trauma. She also talks about waking up and um, gasping for breath and with her heart racing. And when we look at the impact of these uh, sleep disturbances, we see uh, issues around irritability, tiredness, low self-esteem, she's had issues concentration affecting uh, with her driving and also at work and it looks like there might be some emerging issues in her relationship um, with staying to sleep in separate rooms and also some conflict around, around alcohol. I'll be interested coming back to David later uh, in saying that these things might not necessarily be attributable to sleep problems but they may well be connected. And then my next thing, I guess, would be looking at what are the potential targets of treatment for Sally. Uh, we might consider nightmare treatment specifically, uh, but we might also look at the range of unhelpful sleep habits that, that Sally has developed. So she's using her bedroom as a living room. Uh, she has a couple of wines before bed. There are coffee cups around the bedroom. We don't know whether she's drinking coffee going to bed, but she might be. Um, and when she has a bad night, she sleeps through, so um, her, her sleep routines are disrupted. There are also a few hints that there might be other things going on, like pain, uh, there could be obstructive sleep apnea, for instance, as an underlying sleep disorder, and also the possibility that she's actually avoiding sleep, um, which we see in a lot of people who have nightmares. 
But just talking more generally, I suppose, some of the issues for Sally are, are replicated in, in a lot of veterans that we see. Sleep problems are really prevalent in veterans. And in fact, it's one of the main problems that people complain about when they return from deployment. And there are some factors related to the deployment itself that we think probably contribute to sleep problems. Uh, to begin with, the, the physical environment. When you're on deployment, your physical environment is not conducive to good sleep generally. Add to that the stress of being away from home and the stress of deployment and what you're being exposed to on deployment. Um, the, the sleep cycle is likely to be disrupted. So you're likely to have irregular sleep, fewer hours, have to wake up at a moment's notice and, and when you wake up, you know, being immediately ready for action. So people describe that they don't, they don't really let go when they're sleeping in the same way that they do at home. They need to stay alert and stay vigilant. And of course, this is hard to turn off. When, you, when you're back from deployment, back in your normal life, these habits uh, can be hard to break. And then on top of that, where people have been exposed to trauma, uh, they may experience nightmares. Uh, following the trauma and, and that can lead to avoidance of sleep. And, and these issues that we see in, in veterans who've deployed are compounded when there are other things going on like pain and PTSD. So the impacts that we commonly see, some of these are well illustrated by Sally's case, in the short term, mood, concentration, day-to-day -day functioning, relationship issues, but in the longer term, Sleep disturbance can be a precursor to adjustment difficulties and, and mental health problems. And in particular, research has found that sleep disturbance in the early aftermath of trauma has been found to predict the development of PTSD. So it's not just a symptom of PTSD, but it could actually predict the development of PTSD. So I think this really highlights the critical importance of not just being complacent about sleep disturbance, but actually um, getting in and trying to treat it early. When we look at the effective treatments for PTSD, the key uh, evidence-based treatment is cognitive behaviour therapy for insomnia, CBTI, and that's got four core components. Are the cognitive therapy components, looking at perhaps unhelpful ways of thinking that might contribute to, to sleep problems, sleep hygiene, information and habits around good health, environmental practices, that promotes sleep. Stimulus control, which is really around trying to condition and strengthen that association between bed and sleep. So you're encouraging people to only use their bed for sleep and also for sex, but also only sleeping in bed, so not falling asleep on the couch or other places. So really strengthening that connection. And, and finally, sleep restriction, where really trying to increase sleep efficiency by not staying in bed um, for longer periods of time than what you're actually sleeping for. With veterans who also have nightmares, we're looking at CBTI, but also imagery rehearsal therapy. So, so there are two components of the sleep problems for these people. There's the difficulties falling and staying asleep, and then there's the nightmares as well. And, and this is a fundamental difference to normal insomnia, where people really want to get to sleep. Sometimes when people have nightmares, they actually don't want to get to sleep. They avoid sleep. And they might sleep during the daytime because they're less likely to have nightmares, for instance. So standard CBTI might not be sufficient. Um, imagery rehearsal therapy is uh, an, an emerging intervention. I suppose it's got a reasonable amount of evidence behind it. The, the crux of it is that we get people to change the storyline of their dream to increase their sense of mastery or control over the dream with the idea that if the storyline isn't as frightening, it's less likely to wake them up and the dream can therefore perform its um, emotional processing function that, that dreams are thought to have. So we get people to change the storyline and then to rehearse the newly scripted nightmare before going to sleep. And, and often it's useful to pair that with relaxation so that they're going to sleep um, with a, a reasonably relaxed frame of mind. And, and that's something that you know, I'm very happy to talk more about as we go through, Mark, if, if there are questions around that. Thank you very much, Andrea. I bet that you would be happy to talk about it. This has been your life's work for quite a while, hasn't it? Uh, for, I imagine.
treating nightmares. Um, thank you very much. That's a whole lot of really interesting issues raised there. And they, as you say, we will certainly come back to the nightmare issue. Um, I'd also like to come back to your comment about how important it is to uh, to treat sleep problems early, and it raises the whole issue of sequencing treatment that we uh, mentioned with Kurt before. Uh, but we need to move on. So uh, thanks, Andrea. And uh, can I um, now hand over to our final uh, panel member and um, hand over to you, Kurt, for a psychiatrist perspective? Thank you. Um, so uh, everything that um, David and uh, Andrea have said, of course, I would be endorsing. But uh, I've sort of come at this from the perspective of Sally and, uh, you know, what are we facing with this woman? And, of course, I'm going to take a psychiatric perspective to her. And the first thing really is about a general assessment. And the psychiatric approach really... Um, not that it is particularly dissimilar to the other approaches, but it's asking a lot of what questions. So that's the what, uh, why and when and what was actually happening. Um, and uh, then a typical medical thing, doing a physical examination, if necessary, or a mental state examination in my case, of course, looking for mental state signs of usually comorbid uh, psychiatric conditions. Investigations, if indicated, they're usually not that helpful in um, insomnia anyway, might be very helpful in hypersomnia and definitely a collateral history. So talking to Sally's husband is going to be important. We've already got some clues that things are just not right there. The thing that really spoke to me in her history was her, well amongst other things, was her degree of attribution, and that's always something that I'm um, wary of because I think people come to us with ideas about um, what is going on, and um, whilst they may be right, they may also be wrong. And uh, so I've just put a couple of examples there in the text about Sally puts her newfound tiredness down to her sleep now being characterised by disturbing dreams and strange awakenings. Of course, she might be right. But it might be that there's something else going on as well, and I always want to take that into consideration. And then another attribution is um, she wants to go and see a psychologist, uh, and she thinks that if I could just get a good night's sleep, I'll be okay. Again, she might be right, but she might not be. And um, like all professionals, if she were to see a psychologist who wasn't really okay with all of the issues, just as could be with a psychiatrist, she may not get the help she needs, especially if it does turn out that the uh, issues um, really do relate to sleep and people haven't been trained. There's something with veterans, I think, and, and a lot of patients, but particularly with veterans, to be just to be aware for assessors and treatment providers about what I'd call premature closure. That is assuming that everything is related to uh, the person's service. It may not be. And in this case, it, you know, there's alcohol, there's uh, poor sleep habits, and there's looming marital disharmony. I'm always looking to address this formulation question. Why is this particular patient, i.e. Sally, presented in this particular way with all of those symptoms at this particular time? And probably she's presented because there's been a couple of accidents. But to move on. Bearing in, all of that, bearing in mind common psychiatric comorbidities, uh, especially in the veteran population. So this is probably not new to people, but trauma and stress are related conditions like PTSD, adjustment disorders. But what would she be adjusting to, I'm wondering? Depressive disorders, substance misuse, anxiety disorders, somatization type presentation. She's tired, for example. Maybe that's a somatized stress or anxiety and personality issues that might have been there beforehand. And there probably are some with Sally, and I'll come to those in a second. It doesn't mean she's got personality disorder. It just means that they're relevant in the assessment and potentially in the treatment. So here's some of the things that I think are important. Some of them are very basic, and they hit you straight up. The fact that she's 48, she's in midlife. The fact that she's female, not male. The fact that she's a carer. She's been married for 10 years but doesn't have children, what might be the significance of that for the now, but also for the future. She's had a number of deployments and she's done local disaster relief work. And the thing that struck me was she has valued this 
and the opportunity to do something that wasn't only worthwhile, so she's altruistic, but also outside her comfort zone. She's someone who likes to challenge herself. And she was very close to her dad, and she's taken on some of his sort of attitudes. I'm certainly not saying that's abnormal, but it's relevant in understanding Sally and the sort of person that she is. This comment about don't sweat the small stuff, how do you know what's small? That would be one of the things I'd be asking her. So all of that tells us something about her personality, her coping, and then to move on to the sleep aspect, um, I'd be asking her about what does it mean that it's never come easy? Um, I'm not quite sure what that means, so that needs a bit of exploring. And um, it looks like she's changed. She used to not need much sleep and be thin, and maybe that's not the case anymore. Could she have a medical problem, such as hypothyroidism or some other issue? Or in fact, is it related to the alcohol, which I was wondering all along. Um, one of the questions about attribution, of course, if she's right, then maybe if she improves her sleep, the tiredness will abate, and maybe she'll be better. And given that that sort of occurred around about the 2009 Victorian bushfires, did something happen there? So I'd be querying her about that. That would be one of the what, when questions that I'd be looking at. Um, Andrea mentioned the nightmares. The interesting thing in this case is there's two types of nightmares. One suggests, uh, to some extent, a post-traumatic state, but the other is not really a post-traumatic thing and probably suggests more themes around what's going on in her life, concerns about maybe her marriage or about Cameron or welfare type issues. And then, of course, some of the other big stuff. So I'm asking myself, what are really the issues in this case? Is the sleep really the big thing? Or is it, in fact, the fact that she's starting to have marital breakdowns, she's, like her dad, tending to look at things in a don't sweat the small stuff way, and she thought it was small, but really it's not. So I've got loud alarm bells ringing about the significance of some of these other things. And, um, of course, the accidents. Now, just to look at very quickly my um, my perspective on things, over on the left is, is the dummy's approach, and I'm the dummy, by the way, uh, at classifying and clarifying symptoms and signs in psychiatry, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And I just put them there to remind myself uh, and people in the audience of a sort of simple little template, always asking about F for functional status. And there's an issue there for Sally in this case, as I've mentioned. So when I look at the case, I'm thinking, well, she's got insomnia for a number of reasons. She's got nightmares. There's likely delayed phase problems. Alcohol could be underreported. Then there's some mood type symptoms, irritability, constant tiredness, low self-esteem. She's attributing these to perimenopause or poor sleep, but maybe she's developing a primary depressive disorder or maybe it's alcohol related. And then those other things that I'm very concerned about, really, is it her function that's of concern? Her husband has noted it, her boss has noted it, and Sally being Sally, she likes challenges, she's altruistic, she goes pretty hard at stuff, or used to, maybe she hasn't put enough weight on those things being important. And she was surprised that Cameron cared more about her state of mind than the car, which is sort of an interesting comment. I'd, <coughs> I'd be thinking just from that one little piece of information that maybe Cameron's a gem. There's Cameron's quote. It may be points to some more symptoms of concern, maybe a depressive disorder, maybe alcohol related, we're not sure yet. So this is what we've got. All of those problems, as I've mentioned, and I'm wondering about, really, is it something other than sleep that's maybe going on? <coughs> Lovely. But Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Uh, Kurt, thank you. And um, again, a whole lot of stuff there. I was particularly struck by the last dot point on your first slide, which is about um, something about, you know, why is this person presenting with these problems at this time? I think that that formulation is something that we we don't do as consistently as we should do, and it's such an important thing to be able to answer, I think. Anyway, thank you very much for that. Thank you to all our presenters. And um, let's go on now and uh, kick off the broader discussion. And I'm going to ask all the panel members to jump in whenever they like and, as I say, to disagree with each other or to um, present an alternative perspective or to ask questions of each other. 
Um, I should also say that I've been very impressed by the number and the quality of the questions that have come in from our participants over the last week or two. Um, and and I, we would really like to answer each of them individually, but there are literally hundreds and hundreds of them. So we can't do that. But I'm confident that we will be um, addressing all the, all the major issues in our discussion and have done uh, addressed a lot of them already. Tonight, though, we're going to try something a little bit different, which we've never done before. And that is that we're going to try a, uh, a live poll with you to get you to tell us what's important. And so what we've done is to um, theme, put, to put all the comments, the questions that you sent in, into five broad themes. And you can see them on your screen here. Uh, and so we're going to ask you to vote on which one you'd like to discuss most. And you, you've only got 30 seconds, so you're going to have to do it quickly. Can I ask Ronald from Redback, please, to, uh, to start the poll? OK, so you can see it on the screen there. And you need to click on whichever one you think is important. Um, obviously, our panelists have already discussed um, several of these aspects, and, and more will come up. Um, and we can see the results. You, you can't see the results coming in, but we can. Um, and so there's a lot of interest. And uh, uh, oh, there's a clear winner coming out here. So get your, get your votes in. We've only got um, another few seconds for you to vote. So. Uh, Get your votes in as soon as you can. And I feel like the Oscars, really. We've got a very clear winner. So I think we might stop the poll there if we could, uh, Ronald. And um, uh, perhaps you could pull up the results for us. So I'm assuming everybody can see that. Um, and uh, as you can see at the bottom, there's a very clear winner there, which is about the relationship between sleep disorder and PTSD. Um, Clearly, a really important issue for veterans and, and one that we will um, certainly talk about. Um, thank you for that, Ron. Can I get you to close that? And, and we will come back to that question about sleep and PTSD. Before we do, I'd just like to touch on a couple of others off this list, because they are uh, important issues. And um, I'm dying to talk about sleep hygiene, but I'm not going to just yet. I want to kick off actually with medication because this is an issue that I think for many people is important. My guess is that uh, for most people, the person in the street who goes along to their GP complaining of uh, sleep disturbance is quite likely to walk out with a script in their hands, possibly for, for benzodiazepines or, or perhaps one of the newer drugs. Um, so can I just chuck it open to the panel and, and just get your views quickly about the pros and cons of medication? Should we be thinking about medication to treat sleep disorders? Um, I don't know who'd like to take that first. Maybe Curtis? Oh, thank you. Um, well, look, um, from my perspective, the answer is definitely we should be thinking about medications for sleep disorders. Um, but from my point of view, it's really about where the medication fits in the context of every other available um, therapy. So. Um, I think what you were referring to, Mark, was the, the work about um, people who complain of insomnia when they go into primary care. A very, very large percentage will walk out with a hypnotic medication when actually we know that um, CBT with a little I for insomnia, so CBTI is um, probably going to be just as effective or um, maybe even more effective and longer lasting and potentially going to have less side effects and problems in the longer term. So my, my um, approach is uh, to consider it, but really try to shape the patient unless they need medications for something else away from uh, hypnotics in the first instance. Now, that's not always easy, of course. And sometimes people are so distressed, sprung out, and so on, that there needs to be a period of time where pharmacotherapeutic approaches are taken. Of course, I have a biased um, practice, so I might see people who have got comorbid conditions or who are very, very uh, anxious uh, and really stuck. Um, yeah. But at some point, I'm going to be wanting to move them away from medications and into the self-management through CBTI approach. And of course, um, I'm talking about insomnia there, by the way. Yeah. 
So the, the, um, the key there, I guess, is being able to offer the person CBTI or some kind of um, non-pharmacological treatment for, for the insomnia. Uh, David, can I bring you in quickly and just see what, what you would, uh, whether you've got any thoughts that you'd like to add to what Kurt said? Yeah, absolutely. So I agree with Kurt. I uh, have exactly the same approach. Uh, a helpful clinical sort of way of thinking about things as well is trying to differentiate acute insomnia versus chronic insomnia because their treatments are completely different. Think of acute insomnia as there's a situational stressor that throws sleep out temporarily. And if people are highly distressed by that and can't get away from that stressor, then short-term use of a hypnotic just to bridge them over that is actually an appropriate uh, approach. Whereas chronic insomnia, where someone's had symptoms more often than not for three months or more and having an impact on their day-to-day -day functioning, the short-term use of a hypnotic is so not the treatment for that. You know, the treatment for that is changing thinking and behaviour around sleep. And what we see in community practice, general practice, most commonly, where 95% of people presenting with insomnia get a prescription and 90% for a benzodiazepine, is the treatment people are given when they present with chronic insomnia is actually the treatment for acute insomnia. There's this mismatch. And I wish they weren't both called insomnia. I wish they had different names mm -hmm. because they really should be considered different conditions. One's characterised by and perpetuated by change thinking, beliefs, behaviours around sleep. That's chronic insomnia. And the other's characterised by a pretty normal thinking or behaviours around sleep, just situational stress or that's brought on an acute change in circumstances. So they need a completely different approach. Yeah. I certainly like that idea of having uh, different names, using different names for the acute versus chronic. Um, Okay, thank you for that, and I, and I it, I'm, wouldn't be surprised if we come back to touch on medication again a little bit down the track, but some fairly clear responses there from both of you. Um, so let's pick up on this one that, that was the, um, the, the poll choice, as it were, came out the top of the poll, which is the relationship between sleep and PTSD. And um, I guess there's a whole range of ways that we could kick that around, but I'm, I'm going to throw it to you first, Andrea, to see uh, what, what you'd like to talk about it. I guess that... Um, Sleep is, in, is incorporated in the diagnostic criteria for kickoff, so, so it's obviously integral. Um, but can you talk a little bit about how you see that relationship? And um, yeah, I, I, can I just let you rave about it for a minute or two? <laughs> sure. Um, your reference to the Oscars made me a bit nervous about the polling, though, because of course <laughs> that could have been the incorrect uh, favourite favourite uh, course, voting. Yeah. <laughs> it could have been a mistake, but it's not. Um, so yeah, look, as you say, it is integral to the diagnosis of PTSD and uh, the rates of sleep disturbance in people with PTSD are, are very high. It's one of the most commonly endorsed symptoms of PTSD, in particular the, the sleep disruption, the difficulties getting off to sleep and, and staying asleep. Nightmares are the second uh, symptom, sleep-related symptom of PTSD, which are still highly prevalent, uh, so studies would, would you know, vary over time of course, but averages of over 50% of veterans uh, with PTSD experience these recurrent nightmares. And I guess one of the things that I'm really interested in is what's the relationship between those two symptoms. Um, it may be that they are independent and that the sleep disturbance which is one of the increased arousal symptoms of PTSD occurs because the person's unable to relax and, and reduce their arousal enough to have a solid night's sleep, whereas the PTSD nightmares are one of the intrusive symptoms and that they may just occur because the person has PTSD and something triggers their memory of trauma during the night, resulting in a nightmare. So that's one possibility that the two are quite distinct from each other. But I'm inclined to think that it's not as simple as that um, and, and that it's more likely that the two are related. So it may be that because of the frequent awakenings that we see, people are more likely to recall a nightmare. So, so we know that uh, we, we all dream, even though we don't necessarily remember our dreams. But if you're waking frequently during the night, then the chance of you remembering a dream is much higher. Um, it may be as well that the experience of nightmares contributes to the sleep disruption so that people, once, once they've had the, these experiences of nightmares, which can be 
absolutely terrifying and and they are very much like the traumatic event is being relived, re-experienced and so people describe all of the sensory details in post-traumatic nightmares. It's not just the narrative of the storyline of what's happening, it's also the, the sights, the sounds, even the smells people have in their dreams. So they're, they're terrifying experiences. And it stands to reason that that might actually contribute to difficulties getting off to sleep, uh, in part because the person's afraid of falling asleep. So some of the work that we need to do is around changing that orientation towards the experience of nightmares. If we can get people to rehearse changes to their nightmares so that they increase that sense of mastery or control, they can go to bed thinking, OK, I'm ready for this. You know, bring it on. I know what I'm going to do when this, when this nightmare starts. So it's, yeah, as I say, I think the relationship between the two is probably a complicated one and probably one that we need to learn a lot more about. Yeah, um, that's a great answer, Andrew, I must say. Um, so I take your point about the, the complex interrelationship between um, nightmare sleep and PTSD as a diagnosis. And I'd like to bring Kurt in in just a second. Before I do, can I just come back to you, Andrew? Did, um, are there any sort of uh, implications for our assessment when we're assessing a, a veteran um, in terms of teasing out that and in terms of helping us work out whether we should be going for the nightmares straight away or, or the sleep? Or it, it, There may not be any magic answers. Have you got any, any comments about assessment before I bring Kurt in? Um, so look, I would say in general, even though we, we have in recent years uh, been targeting nightmares specifically, in general I would say the most parsimonious approach is to treat the PTSD if someone has PTSD. So using evidence-based treatments for PTSD uh, and then if the nightmares and sleep disturbance may well respond to that, in which case you've treated everything you know, with one methodology. If, if the person has had standard treatment and they've still got sleep disturbance and nightmares, I think that's when we would look to target them specifically. And also perhaps just worth noting that these problems, sleep disturbance problems, can occur in veterans without PTSD, of course. So we don't want to jump to the conclusion that someone who has this sort of sleep disturbance necessarily has PTSD. They need to meet the full diagnostic criteria for PTSD. Yeah. OK. Um, but obviously the, the possible presence of nightmares there as a, as a symptom of PTSD makes it slightly different to other perhaps comorbidities or whatever you might call it. Um, Kurt, do you want to come in at all there? Have you got anything that you'd like to add in terms of that relationship mm -hmm. between sleep and PTSD and perhaps as compared to other disorders? Well, um, I'll just endorse what a terrific answer uh, that was by Andrea. Um, as I was as I was listening, um, I, I sort of thought of some of the patients I've had and, of course, um, I don't want to sound like a crack record, but I thought, well, you know, sometimes the co comorbidities of PTSD or even the treatment of PTSD can also have a relationship with specific sort of sleep problems, if not sleep disorders. So, um, for example, uh, persons with depressive disorders and substance misuse disorders, it might really be those things that are actually causing the sleep complaint or the sleep difficulty. As someone who's overweight, it could be the OSA, but I'm not in a good position to um, sleep at me in my way uh, to really talk about that. And in relation to treatment, um, I think um, I think Andy has mentioned this. It's really important to get to um, try to treat the trauma as best you can. The only proviso, I suppose, I would see is if, if somebody is so depressed that they cannot engage in therapy, then, okay, the depression has to be addressed. And if there's some other problem that, in a sense, is, in inverted commas, sabotaging the potential for treatment or treatment response, such as alcohol or substance misuse, well, of course, that needs to be addressed first. But I think I'd echo Andrea's comments about um, getting to the trauma first. That, by the way, doesn't um, uh, suggest that we shouldn't engage in some sleep specific treatments um, for whatever the sleep problem is, insomnia or, or nightmares, it's just that the PTSD syndrome 
uh, really does need to be addressed. Um, we were talking, uh, or at least I was trying to talk and, and nobody could hear me, about the idea of going on to talk about sleep hygiene. Um, sleep hygiene, I guess, has been, as I understand it, the go-to treatment for insomnia for a very, very long time. And so I'm very interested to hear from David about the kind of pros and cons and his reservations. Before we do that, I wonder if I could ask one of the others to just give us a quick um, overview of what sleep hygiene is, just so we know we're all on the same page. And then I'll uh, come to David to talk about his reservations. But um, Andrea or Kurt, perhaps Kurt, would you, would you be able to just a very, very quick overview of what sleep hygiene is? Well, um, sleep hygiene basically is tips for better sleep. And um, you can Google it and look it up on the net, and you'll get um, a bunch of um, sort of recommendations about how to optimize a good night's sleep. And some of them are incredibly simple, like um, ensure the optimal temperature and comfort of your bed and so on and so forth. But some of them are more, I suppose, scientific medical, things like uh, you know, cutting down on caffeine and not napping before um, you sleep and um, things like um, uh, you know building some relaxation into your day. Some of them are very simple, almost motherhood type statements. Um, the I just say one thing about them. Um, sometimes you see what's called sleep hygiene on the net, and it says you should have a regular routine, including going to bed at the same time every night and getting up at the same time every morning. Um, that is sort of true if you're not an insomniac, because if you suffer with insomnia, you should go to bed when you're sleeping, not so much at the same time every night. Um, it's probably best to like, I really want to hear what David's got to say about this as well. Yep. <laughs> it's not a treatment, by the way. Okay, okay. So let's, let's go to you, David. So um, I think, well, am I right in saying that it is one of the most commonly used interventions for insomnia? Um, tell, me, tell us about your reservations. Yep. So if you look at the evidence, it's the most commonly used and the least effective intervention for insomnia. There you go. That, that's, my, that's my gripe with it. Right. Um, when we were reviewing all the literature in CBTI over the last 20 years as part of a meta-analysis we published uh, last year, we looked at about 300 papers, and uh, sleep hygiene as monotherapy, so one component of CBT, um, really was barely effective. A couple of papers on it as monotherapy from the early 90s. And since then, and in the last 10 years, sleep hygiene has been the control condition in CBTI research, just in recognition that it actually doesn't have much of an effect. Um, so if you use sleep hygiene as one of the five core components of CBTI, then it's a good starting point of making sure that people are not disrespectful of sleep. Think of it in that way. So you're not drinking coffee too late, not exercising too late, not drinking too much alcohol. You know, you're not disrespecting sleep. But I tell people I need to score 50% on the sleep hygiene exam because a lot of my patients who get insomnia have perfectionistic traits. That's one of the risk factors for insomnia. And they want to score 100% on that exam. And they end up really beating themselves up about I'm not doing it right, I'm not sleeping because I haven't found the right set of rules. I haven't got enough rules around sleep. And again, as health professionals, I can see health professionals get complicit with this. When someone's doing five or six different things, they're already quite rigid in their thinking about sleep, almost rule-bound about their sleep. And the health professional goes, well, there's this other sleep hygiene point you're not addressing. That's why you might be having problems. Move on. We've got to move on. There are four other components that are evidence-based for CBTI, and we have to address those. So cognitive therapy, stimulus control, sleep restriction, and relaxation strategies. So if you're delivering CBTI for clients, you've got to have at least three of those components, and preferably four or five of those components. If you're doing monotherapy with sleep hygiene, you're doing a disservice to the clients, and the literature does not support that as a therapy. The other thing is um, patients have accessed it. I like Kurt's description. If you Google that, that's the 10 tips to sleep well tonight, that's sleep hygiene. And so if as a health professional that's all we're delivering, people don't value it. They won't value your opinion. They won't feel that you've, they've in a, a knowledge gradient. They'll say, oh, they knew as much as I did. I could have got what I got from them off half post. Why go and see them again? So we do need to deliver more value to our clients as health professionals and deliver more evidence-based therapy. So that's why we need the other components of CBTI. 
which is an, a very effective therapy. I'm a really strong proponent of CBTI, but just don't want people to get stuck on sleep hygiene and very rule bound around. Sure. Sleep. Okay, Can I add but something to that, Mike. Please sorry, do, Andrea. Yeah, and I was just going to say that they're also the same as being found in in studies with veterans specifically that sleep hygiene by itself isn't effective. Um, I, I have to say that clinically, in working with people, um, it never ceases to amaze me um, that those basic so sleep hygiene tips or sort of good sleeping tips are not necessarily intuitive. Um, you know, one would think that they might be, but, but they're not. So sometimes for some people just some of those, uh, introducing some of those simple ideas can actually make a difference. That, that's all I want to say. I, I don't disagree that it's not a um, standalone treatment, but it can be an important component for some people. Yeah. So in fact, I was going to ask David that. So I'm, I'm, I'm pleased that you're not throwing it out altogether, David. That's something. So it can at least be a component of uh, CBTI. But um, uh, has there been a component analysis? I guess what I'm, I'm wondering is, would any of the other components stand up on their own, do you think? Yeah, so there's some data on sleep restriction. Really nice paper by a psychiatrist uh, from Auckland who looked at sleep restriction in general practice as a monotherapy and showed it actually worked well as a monotherapy for insomnia. Uh, and there are other papers of the other components as monotherapy as well, stimulus control, uh, cognitive therapy, uh, not so much relaxation as a standalone therapy. But if you look at effect size, combination therapy, which has really been the standard over at least the last 10 years, has a much higher effect size. And I'd be interested in Kurt's views on this or, or Andrea's, but I find if I'm presenting CBTI in a group or working with individuals, if I present something from each of the five components, individual patients will say, you know what, those two bits work for me, but the other three, mm -hmm. nah, not to my liking. And so just using a range of techniques, people will pick and choose, yeah, that, that's me. I, I'm going to go with that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I, think okay. that's, I think that's true for a lot of therapies, actually, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, thank you very much for that, and I am slightly relieved that we're not checking it out all together. That's a, a bit of a relief to me. Um, one of the things, I would like to move on to something a little bit different now. Um, one of the things that I find a lot with my um, clients with PTSD, and often veterans as well, is that they report waking in the night in a start, in a state of um, sort of high anxiety, heart racing and so on, and yet are unable to uh, identify any kind of dream content, any nightmares or whatever. Um, I wonder if people could comment, and I might go to you first, Andrea, but hear what others have to say, um, about what you think might be going on there. Why is it that people are waking in this kind of panic state in the middle of the night? And it's, it's not, um, I think, restricted to PTSD by any means, actually. But what's going on there? Mm. Well, I, I'm actually really interested to hear what other people say about that as well, because I, I'm, I'm not sure. I guess that... Um, where people wake up and they don't have a, a dream, I think that, that is, you know, they probably haven't dreamt. I think they would remember the dream if they had. What they'll often wake up and say is, I, I might have been having a dream, but I don't remember it when I woke up. Um, I don't know. I think that there's, as I was mentioning before, that when people have PTSD and they've got that ongoing increased arousal, that when the normal arousals happen, happen during sleep, if you've got a sort of elevated heart rate that's accentuated by that awakening, I think that that might explain waking up suddenly and, and feeling like your heart's racing and um, you're, you're sort of wide awake. Um, I don't know whether in some cases, and, and the, um, David and Curtis will both know a lot more about sleep apnea than I do, but my understanding of sleep apnea is that when people wake up with a hypopnea, that it's that sensation of, of choking or not being able to get breath and that that might contribute to that sudden awakening as well and and the elevated heart rate on awakening. But I'm I'm not sure and I'd, I'd be really interested in what the others have to let's, say. Um, let, let's, let's bring in the others. What about you, David? Have you got yeah. any comments on that sudden awakening? Yeah, I, 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 agree. I agree with Andrea. You, you sort of think of that... Um, heightened adrenergic activity, heightened vigilance uh, in trauma, meaning you get an exaggerated startle response to anything that happens during sleep. So often with the sleep apnea, you, know, you get a minor airway narrowing that's actually not a big deal, but in someone who's got PTSD or has got that hypervigilance, it creates this big adrenergic response. 
so yes, people with PTSD can get sleep apnea, but they can, in the same way as they'll wake to noises or other things, they'll get a startle response. They can get a startle response to even feeling minor stimuli in the upper airway. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Thank Did you want to add anything, Kurt, or shall I move on? No, look, uh, no, um, it's a me three. I agree with the other guys. Yeah. Okay. Um, in terms of deciding on treatment, I wonder, you know, we've kind of touched on this a few times, but, but I'd like to come back to it. Um, and I perhaps will throw this one to you, Kurt, actually. Um, I'm wondering about the order, the sequencing of treatment, and whether, whether we should be spending time working out what's a kind of primary disorder or a secondary disorder, or, or do we just um, try, tr try and treat them as they come along, as it were? Do, do you have any views about the benefits of identifying primary disorders? And I'm thinking particularly in the context of sleep. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Um, uh, well, I, I sort of like to have a bit both ways with this one because um, I think the sleep complaint or the sleep disorder warrants, uh, if not treatment, at least consideration of symptomatic relief on its own behalf um, if that's able to be easily achieved where, it's, um, where, the, where the sleep complaint is secondary to um, some other condition um, but I think um, there's also room to um, try to establish if the, if the person appears to be highly distressed, aroused, deeply depressed, um, I think there's room to um, sometimes just say look I think we've got to deal with this other problem first before we come to your, your sleep complaint. Now, that might be relevant, for example, if somebody is severely substance dependent, for example. Um, but then in a case, for example, like Sally, I'd, I'd be thinking, look, we've got to go at everything pretty quickly because there's been some daytime impairment, role impairment, in a couple of ways, and we can do some very simple, um, relatively quick acting things here that potentially will improve your sleep and if it's just your sleep that's leading to all of the problems then hopefully everything's going to improve whilst at the same time we look at everything else. Okay. Yep. Yep. That makes good sense. Makes good sense. Okay. We've only got a few minutes to go and, and I would really like to try and um, just throw some fairly quick questions out there and see if we can get some very quick responses just in the last few minutes. Um, most of the questions that we've asked tonight have come in from the participants. And here's a couple more that have come in from participants that I'd just like to uh, quickly touch on. Um, one of the questions is going back to medication. It's asking about whether there are any particular medications for nightmares. And um, can you just, I'm wondering if Andrea or, 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 um, or Kurt would like to comment on that. I guess Prazosin is the one that, that keeps getting suggested. But do you, do you have any views on using medications for nightmares? Um, I'm happy to, to start. <laughs> So yeah, prazosin is the um, the medication that has been tried and found to be successful with some um, people who have nightmares, post-traumatic nightmares. So my understanding of this, and Kurt will no doubt explain it more, but that it, this is a, originally a medication for hypertension and, and its impact on nightmares was accidentally discovered by people who were being treated for hypertension and then reported that their nightmares were also diminishing. Um, I think there's work going on at the moment trying to get a bit more specificity around what sort of people are likely to benefit from prazosin as a treatment. Um, it's not a cure-all for all by any means. And what, what I see clinically is that people say that they have less recall of the content of their nightmares but they don't feel as though it changes their overall sleep disruption. Um, okay. So, yeah. All right, interesting. Um, are you okay with that, Kurt, or would you like to add anything oh, to that? No, I'm very okay with that. Just to add one or, one or two things, um, um, the, um, the SSRI medications, whilst not really first line for PTSD, uh, I know we were talking just about nightmares, but if we extend the concept a bit to the four syndrome of PTSD, um, if by chance they come to be used um, 
and there is a role for them. Um, many of them have REM suppressing effects. So, you know, often people will say that their dreams are, are diminished, their nightmares are diminished. Um, but it's, it's a, in my experience, it's a bit hit and miss. And the only other thing I would say is that um, I think sometimes patients uh, like a choice around what, what they're going or how they're going to approach a problem. So, um, Prazosin is 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 definitely um, in line to be used for nightmares, not just in PTSD, but also nightmare disorder. Um, but um, some people don't want to use medications, and so some of the other um, psychological therapies, uh, Andrew referred to them um, a bit earlier, are, um, are sort of promising. Okay, and they're definitely worth considering. Okay, good, good, good. And let me pick up on psychological therapies. The last question we've got about one minute before I need to, to wind up the discussion. Um, mindfulness is um, getting a lot of uh, interest across a whole range of disorders. Let me throw this one to you, David, if I could. Is there, um, is there a place for mindfulness in the treatment of sleep disorders? Just a, a very relatively quick response. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think of it as CBTI plus. So, you know, in the previous days we think of the relaxation being more passive relaxation, progressive muscular relaxation, those type of things. Now I think more about ACT, mindfulness, more sort of active relaxation. Because in insomnia, um, active thought control, trying to suppress thoughts actually predicts worsening insomnia, uh, whereas a more mindful approach um, is a predictor of improvements with insomnia. And we've working on, we've actually done a trial looking at mindfulness in a group therapy in insomnia and shown it's an effective treatment, just preparing that for publication. Great, great. I, I like that idea of um, CBTI plus. I think that's, that's good, yeah. The new improved version. Okay, good. I like that. Thank you very much um, to everybody. I'm just constantly amazed at how quick the time goes. I don't know how it feels for the participants, but for us on the panel, the time just goes in no time at all. So we do have to wind up. And in doing so, I would like to ask each of our panelists to just um, take a few minutes, uh, not, not a few minutes, one minute maximum to, to kind of um, leave us with any take home messages or, or, or any kind of summaries that they'd like us to go away with. Um, and perhaps we'll do it in the order of the speakers. David, uh, any final comments? Yeah, so my comments would be in working with clients with sleep problems, listen. Listen to the narrative. Listen to emotion and beliefs around sleep and behaviours around sleep because that's often where the gold is and where you're actually able to make a change. Uh, don't buy into people's attributional bias. It's all about the sleep because in actual fact, maybe they're busy bees during the day, anxious, depressed, and they don't want to you know, address that but want to focus on the sleep. And if you are seeing people with anxiety and depression and sleep problems or PTSD and sleep problems, the research shows the sleep problems need their own independent treatment. So that thinking of treat one, treat the primary disorder, the secondary disorder sorts itself out, that's old thinking. When people have got two different disorders, insomnia or sleep disturbance and PTSD, you need an approach for each of those. Great. Okay, thank you very much, David. And I like that first comment, first and foremost, listen. I think that's pretty good advice for us all. Thank you, David. Uh, Andrea, a few comments that um, you'd like people to leave with? Sure. Um, I think that a comment that I made earlier about the importance of intervening early with sleep problems is something that I'd like to, to emphasise. You know, we know that sleep can be a precursor to other mental health problems as well as being something that accompanies mental health problems. But if we can get in early um, before some of those entrenched habits have been formed, I think that's, that's really good for outcomes. And I was really interested in the comments that the others made around the use of sleep medications and that the potential, even though that, that distinction between acute and chronic insomnia I think is a really important one, that if we can help someone to get a good night's sleep after a trauma, for instance, um, in those first few days, as well as accompanying that with the messages around CBTI, that hitting that with, with those things for some people, not for everyone, but where it's needed, um, might be an important element of, of that early intervention. Yeah. It seems weird with the psychologist advocating medication, but um, yeah, I think it certainly has its place for some people. Sure. 
But either way, early intervention is going to be an important key. I, I quite agree. Uh, and finally, Kurt, just a few words from you to, to close. Any uh, any final comments? Well, uh, just just to endorse um, what David and Andrea have said, really, Mark. And the only things that I would add, I guess, is, is that um, you know it's a really sleep disorders, sleep disturbances is a really um, interesting area. It's very common, and it can be very very complex. And so. Um, if one takes the time to sort of get into it and, and um, think about it uh, in this sort of multidisciplinary manner, um, then it can be very, very rewarding and um, it can lead to fantastic um, collaborations with other professionals as well. Super. Thank you very much indeed and thank you, uh, thank you to all of us, all of you. Um, so, uh, as I say, time has run out. We're going to have to wind up. And I'll just leave you with a few final uh, admin uh, kind of things. First of all, um, MHPN uh, supports practitioner networks. So if you want to get together with a group of other health professionals from different disciplines in your area, MHPN can help you to do that. So if you fill in the relevant section of the feedback survey, MHPN will follow up with you and link you into a local network. And that's a really, I think, invaluable kind of uh, resource for, for clinicians out there in the field. Um, and talking of resources, um, there, there are a number of resources associated with this webinar that have been recommended by our panelists and by Department of Veterans Affairs. They are, well, they're actually accessible in the bottom right-hand corner there, but uh, they will be accessible to everybody at the, the uh, closure of this webinar. So. Do check through those. There's some really very useful stuff in there as well. And um, can I remind everybody, please, to uh, complete the feedback survey before you log out. It will come up on the screen as soon as the session closes. And for those who do complete the feedback survey, then you'll get your uh, attendance certificate and the, and the links to the resources and so on. So um, in the meantime, keep an eye out for the next webinar. As I say, it will be sometime in April. We don't have a definite date yet. But it will be looking at substance use disorders in particular, particular reference to veterans and serving personnel. Uh, I'd like to thank you very much indeed for joining us, to all the participants. Uh, we got up to a total of uh, 728, which is a very, very impressive number. Um, thank you all for, for joining and being so engaged. And a particularly big thank you, of course, to our panelists for their uh, their wonderful input input to us all. So I'll leave it there, and uh, good night to all of you. Good night.